Hello, everyone, and welcome to Welcoming Nature with your to Your Yard. I'm Melanie Wallace Creamer. I'm the greenhouse manager here at George Washington's Mount Vernon. In addition to being the greenhouse manager, I'm also a very avid gardener. And some things that I'm very passionate about are not just plants, but also insects and birds and creating a viable ecosystem in your own yard. So today we're going to talk about how you can do that. Um, and first of all, just some general things about why plants, insects, and birds are important. All right, let's get started. So why are plants important? Well, because they're essential for life. They are the source of energy for all land-dwelling creatures. They produce oxygen, which I know I like to breathe, so that's a very good thing for all of us. Uh, tree roots, they filter rainwater, reduce erosion and pollution, and trees in particular are carbon sinks. They use atmospheric carbon to build their tissues. And a large sugar maple can sequester 450 pounds of carbon each year. Animals depend on plants for food, yet either directly or indirectly, and the diversity of plants affects the diversity of animals in a habitat. So the more different kinds of plants you have, the more types of animals you're gonna have in that habitat. And most animals depend on insects for food. If there's no insects, there are no higher life forms. 37% of animal species on earth are plant eating insects. They provide food to other animals. So their purpose really is to just go out, eat plants and capture the energy from plants and then let themselves be eaten by predators. And then of course those um, animals that consumed them are then sometimes eaten as well and passes on up the food chain. And pollinators in particular are essential to life. If pollinators were to disappear, so would 87 to 90% of the plants on earth. We're gonna talk mostly today about caterpillars because they're a really important part of the food chain because they support our bird populations. So 96% of North America's terrestrial birds feed their young insects and the majority of which are caterpillars adult moths, or other arthropods like spiders. Caterpillars, well, they're super nutritious. They're high in protein, they've got a high fat content, and they, have carot they contain carotenoids, which are very important for healthy uh, birds in particular, and also humans need carotenoids to be healthy as well. And all vertebrates get their carotenoids from plants. Now, this statistic that comes up next, I thought, and I still think, is completely amazing. 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars are needed for one nest of chickadees to be raised, raised to fledging. So that means when they're starting to fly and leave the nest. Uh, and chickadee parents actually feed their young for about another three weeks after they fledge. And they haven't uh, done any studies to document the amount of caterpillars that takes yet to feed them. But that's amazing. Think about how many trips a parent bird is making every day to go out and get caterpillars to bring back to the nest to feed their young. So the bottom line is, if there's not enough caterpillars to feed the baby birds, the baby birds aren't going to survive. The amount of undisturbed habitat remaining in the United States is not enough to support the diversity of our wildlife. One of these reasons is that the remaining land is greatly fragmented and the more fragmented the land becomes and then the smaller the area becomes, the fewer number of species that can actually live in that area because the number of species in an area directly depends on the size of that area. Currently, we have 12% of all of our bird species in danger of extinction due to habitat loss and invasive species via either uh, invasive species of plants or invasive species of birds as well. And there's been an almost 50% reduction in bird populations for most bird species in the last 50 years. So we're going to talk about some of these causes. Why is this all happening? Well, the American lawn, which has become a real status symbol here in the United States. So over 40 million acres in this country are planted in turf, turf grass. And you need more than 8 billion gallons of water every day during the summer to irrigate it, or at least people think they need to irrigate their lawns. Uh, and currently in certain areas of the country, you know, we're facing water shortages. So 
Is irrigating your turf grass really the best use of our water resources? 40% of chemicals used on the lawns are banned in other countries and they're known carcinogens. So I've done 75 different studies to link these various lawn chemicals with cancer. And unfortunately, the ones who are getting the cancer most frequently are our pets and our children because they're the ones who are in closest contact with the turf grass. And I mean, that's not something that I want for my kids or my pets. We also hear a lot about how you have to fertilize, fertilize, fertilize your lawn because it's like, oh, keep it green. You have to fertilize. Well, we don't, the lawns don't actually need as much fertilizer as we end up putting on it. And 40 to 60% of the fertilizer that gets applied to the lawns ends up in our surface and groundwater and contaminates it. Here's some things we can do. So a goal would be to reduce the size of your lawn by at least half increase your native plantings, which we're going to talk more about a little bit later. Stop applying a fertilizer with the pre-emergent and the chemicals in it. Instead, you can use the lawn clippings themselves to fertilize the lawn because when you mow the grass and let the clippings fall into the grass, it will go ahead and they will break down and put nutrients back into the soil. And I love this that I read. Think of your lawn like an area rug instead of wall-to-wall -wall carpeting. I just love that because I think it's a great way to think about it. Turn the grass into an accent plant. So have small areas in your yard for your kids to play and, you know, maybe to sit out on, uh, you know, your pets to run around, but don't make it wall to wall carpeting. So if one of the things we want to do is plant native plants before we can really get started on intensively planting our native plants, we need to talk about removing invasive plants because unfortunately we have a lot of invasive plants in this country. Uh, the plants I'm going to talk about are all on the list of invasive plants in Virginia. And there's well over a hundred plants on that list. I'm just picking a few to talk about today. So garlic mustard, kudzu and Japanese stilt grass. These are all major, major problems in our ecosystems. And you might think, well, you know, why, why is this such a big deal? Why does everyone talk about invasive plants? Or I guess my hope is why does everyone talk about invasive plants? Well, because invasive plants come in to our ecosystems and they outcompete or do things to take over our native plants. And then when our native plants don't grow, they're not available to provide food for the wildlife that needs them. And then that wildlife in turn can't survive. Kudzu in particular is really bad because that just literally smothers entire ecosystems. I mean, climbs up trees and comes back down and completely covers the ground. Autumn olive, that's a huge problem. I know I personally am battling that in my house and it spreads really easily because the birds like to eat the berries um, and then they excrete the berries and the berries of course contain seeds and then a new autumn olive plant grows Calorie pears or the Bradford pear. Bradford is a cultivar of the calorie pear. They're spreading all over into our native ecosystems. They're very commonly planted in subdivisions because it was a really easy tree to plant there for landscapers because it was cheap. It grows really fast, so it gave the neighborhood an instant look. Um, but it's not a high quality tree because it grows really fast. The wood quality is really poor and the tree is very short lived but it sends seeds around into our ecosystem and contaminates our native plantings. Bamboo that spreads by rhizomes is also another invasive plant that is spreading around very aggressively. Here's some other ones to keep your eye out for. Porcelain berry, I'm seeing this more and more popping up everywhere. Wisteria, the Japanese and Chinese wisteria. There is actually a native wisteria that is less aggressive. And so if you do want to plant a wisteria plant or it's more a native wisteria, but steer clear of the Japanese and Chinese wisteria. Um, and they're, they're still very commonly sold in garden centers. So you have to know what you look for when you go shopping for your plants. Oriental bittersweet is also a problem. This uh, bottom photo here, I just want to be able to see what some of these invasive plants do, particularly these invasive vines. So they actually basically strangle the tree. This right here is um, in the center is the stem 
of the bittersweet vine that's twining itself around the tree and, and strangles it. And then the top slide, top of the slide, this is the leaves, and then the berries are starting to show as well. And once again, there is also an American bittersweet, so a native bittersweet you can grow. But now we're observing that there's some problems because the Oriental bittersweet is actually crossing with the American bittersweet in some instances. Oh, good old English ivy. Yes, I know some people don't like to admit this or talk about it, but English ivy is an invasive plant. It does cause problems in our ecosystems because it crawls along the floor and smothers out our native understory plants, and then it's gonna it will climb up the trees um, and basically eliminates the amount of light getting to the trees, and then they have a problem photosynthesizing, and then eventually it weakens them, and then they will die. Asian honeysuckle, another one. We also have native honeysuckles, so if you like honeysuckle, you can look at our native honeysuckles. Norway maple, it's one of the most commonly planted shade trees in this country, and it's become a problem. It's invasive. It invades our native woodlands. And it's a real shame because we have so many beautiful canopy trees, native canopy trees that will support wildlife uh, that we could choose to plant instead. So these are things to think about when you're working on the landscaping in your yard. And then the good old vinca vine. Two, a couple different types of vinca vine. They're both invasive. If you have them, Get rid of them. Plant something else. There's lots of other amazing ground covers you could use instead. So let's talk about what is a native plant because believe it or not, this is actually something that comes up a lot. Like, so what is actually a native plant? And different people have different definitions for what a native plant is. But to me, and I pulled out three different definitions here, this is the true definition of a native plant and what I would say a true plants person would use. So a plant, it has to be indigenous to this country, and it was growing here. So it means it was growing here basically before European settlement. So it was already growing here in the 1400s. Um, it occurs naturally in a particular region, state, ecosystem, and habitat without humans intervening. So I think something we should talk about is, yes, you can say like there's a plant and it's native to North America, but we really need to get more specific than that because so here on the East Coast, it's best to focus on the plants or we want to focus on plants that are native to the East Coast. And particularly, you can get even more specific what's native to the county that you live in. And those are the plants that are going to thrive versus, you know, planting a plant that's say North, native to the West Coast on the East Coast, it will most likely struggle. Now, some of them don't. Um, but, you know, if we're really going to talk about turning your yard into an ecosystem for the wildlife that lives there, you want to focus on the plants in your region of the country. Well, you ask, well, why plant native? I want to have a beautiful yard. Why should I plant native? Because I think there's a misconception where a lot of people think that if you're going to plant native plants, that your landscape has to be messy. Um, and actually, I, I get that a lot, and, you know, when we, we have our plant sales and people come and they want advice about what plants they should buy. I can't tell you how many times people have said to me, well, I, I don't want to plant that tree because it's messy. Well, nature is messy. Nature is not meant to be sterile and pristine. And there there is beauty in not having everything completely orderly. And I hope and I personally, and I hope that others too, would consider the value of planting native plants and creating a diverse ecosystem that supports a lot of different wildlife species to be more valuable than having just a completely sterile landscape, which is what the majority of people currently have when your landscape is primarily lawn. So native plants are incredibly important because they're the foundation of our terrestrial food webs. So most insects are host plant specialists. 90% of them eat only one type or just a few types of plants. And here is pictured as a great example of that. Monarch caterpillars only eat plants in the milkweed family. So the female monarchs are going to come and where they're going to lay their eggs is onto a milkweed and then the caterpillar is going to hatch and then that's the kind of food that the caterpillar is going to eat. Something else I want to touch on really quickly is I see people making comments all the time to say, 
Oh no, that's not right. I saw a monarch caterpillar on a tomato plant. I saw a monarch caterpillar, you know, on my, um, let's see, peony plant, something, anything. I actually had a monarch caterpillar on my, one of my fig trees. Well, that has to do with pupation. So when caterpillars reach the stage where they've consumed enough food and then they're ready to make their chrysalis, most of them actually leave their host plants to go make a, their chrysalis. So if you find a caterpillar on another plant that's not its host plant, that means that it's ready to spin its chrysalis, pupate. Um, and you'll find they have different ways of doing this. The monarch caterpillar makes a very classic, actually looks like the letter J, it goes and hangs up on the plants and then it will spin its chrysalis. So that's why you see caterpillars on plants that are not their host plants. And also you have to look at the caterpillar and actually figure out what uh, species of caterpillar it is because I also see a lot of people make comments um, about their monarch butterfly caterpillars are eating say parsley or fennel or carrots those are black swallowtail caterpillars. And this is back to, they have very specific host plants. So, and sometimes it's easy to mix them up because they look similar, but it's important to know what species you're working with when you make comments like that, or just, you know, work on educating yourself because there are so many different species of caterpillars out there. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about this, but there are 180,000 different species in the Lepidoptera. So that's the, the order that all these insects belong to. So the, the butterflies, moths, um, and then also they call them skippers, which is kind of, looks kind of like a butterfly moth cross, basically. That's what it is. And so these species need their host plants, and they're not able to survive on their alien species or a lot of these invasive plants that we've planted or just species that you, you know, got, go by at the garden center, but they're not native here, even if they haven't become a problem as far as becoming invasive. Something else that I think is worth to note is, for example, like the autumn olive. One of the arguments people made make for autumn olive, and one of the reasons why it was brought into this country was it's like, oh, well, it has berries on it and they will feed the birds. Well, we have lots of our own native plants to feed the birds uh, and they're, they're more valuable. Here's why. They've done studies to show, they've looked at the berries and the content of the berries. Well, berries from an autumn olive are very high in sugar versus berries from one of our great native plants, a native spice bush, are very high in fat. So when a bird needs to fuel their migration, it's better for them and they would rather eat berries off of the spice bush because that fat is going to sustain them a lot longer and it's much much healthier diet for them. Yes. Are they going to go eat the autumn olive seeds? Of course, because if that's the only plant around and they're hungry, they're going to eat some berries so they have food. But I've heard it compared to, it's like, if we would go out and eat a donut, that would be the autumn olive versus eating a very healthy meal, well-balanced, say maybe you had a nice salad for lunch. That would be the equivalent of eating a spice bush. And I don't know about you. I mean, I do love a donut, but I have to say, like, every time I eat a donut, then I actually really don't feel that good afterwards. Um, but if I have a nice, you know, balanced meal, then I do feel good. So it's the same for the birds. We need to stay away from the junk food. All right. So I'm going to talk about creating a layered landscape. And there's many factors that go into creating a layered landscape. So this is one part of that canopy trees. So those are going to be the trees, your very, very tall trees. So what you see when you think of a woodland, your tallest tree species. And just here's a few that are native to, and of course, since I'm here in Virginia, uh, most plants we're focusing on are from Virginia or at least the mid-Atlantic region. So the tulip tree or tulip poplar, pignut hickory, sugar maples, and white oaks. And we want to think about creating groves of trees. So you want to plant them at a much higher density that has been done in the past or you see recommended in our traditional textbooks because you want to basically be emulating creating an, a woods in your yard. So now you've put your canopy trees in and now you have to think about adding understory trees and shrubs to that as well. So here's some understory trees and shrubs. 
Red bud is a great one. American hazelnut, very attractive shrub, also provides a lot of food for wildlife. The spice bush that I was just talking about produces very nutritious berries. And pawpaw is a fun one because that will produce fruit that you can eat. Makes a very nice understory tree for moist areas. Gets attractive yellow foliage in the fall and is the host of the zebra swallowtail butterfly. And I can mention that for lighthouse plants too, like the spice bush is the host for the spice bush swallowtail caterpillar. And then another part of this layered landscape would be herbaceous perennials. So here's some of our native perennials. We have native columbine, common milkweed, the butterfly weed, which is also part of the milkweed family. Both of them are food for monarch butterfly caterpillars. Cardinal flower, Joe pie weed. Instead of your typical black eyed Susan, there's a plant called brown eyed Susan and New England aster. Native grasses and sedges. So here's a few of our native grasses. So we have switchgrass, little blue stem, big blue stem, and then sedges. So sedges aren't grasses. They actually like sometimes a lot of look like grasses, but they're their own plant category. And there's basically a sedge for any condition imaginable. So there's sedges that you know, grow in shade, sedges that grow in sun, sedges that take really dry conditions, sedges that need really wet conditions. It's actually a very amazing group of plants that most people don't know anything about. So when you go ahead and you combine all these plants together, you're really creating, you're creating this layered landscape. So when you combine these different types of plants together, you're creating a habitat that attracts many different species to your yard. The goal is to convert your yard or increase your planting so that your yard is at least 70% native plant species from these different categories is they do think that if we can all get to a point where our yard is at least 70% native plants, that we could at least sustain a lot of the bird populations. And the bird that they use in that study, based on what I talked about earlier, it's from the study where they were studying the Carolina chickadees to determine how many caterpillars they need to feed their young uh, to actually get the, the baby birds to fledge and survive. And then something else to think about when you're designing a landscape or making plant selections for your yard is what's called keystone species. And those are the species that support the other species in the ecosystem and help them coexist. So there's a very small percentage of plants that support a very large number of the Lepidoptera. So the <clears throat> butterflies, moths, and the skippers, 5%. So 5% of the plants host 70 to 75% of these caterpillars that are needed to feed our bird populations and other insects and just other wildlife. So that's pretty amazing. So really those are the plants to focus on if you're going to build a truly diverse ecosystem in your yard. Something else I wanna talk about, and I kind of touched on this a little bit before, is that people seem to think that just because you're gonna grow native plants, that equals a messy looking landscape. It's not true. You can design a beautiful garden and create habitat niches, and it can look like a garden, not just a weedy mess. And you can actually design a formal garden with native plants. The type of plant, this is native or non-native, that's not the factor that determines if your landscape looks formal or not. It's how you actually put the design together is what makes it look formal. You know, formal designs utilize a very, usually very symmetrical, uh, aspect to their designs versus informal uses a lot of asymmetrical. So there's different factors to think about. So I just included, these are two books that I really like and recommend if you want to read about this yourself. Uh, Planting in a Post-Wild World, Designing Plant Communities for Resilient Landscapes by Thomas Rayner and Claudia West, and The Living Landscape, Designing for Beauty and Biodiversity in the Home Garden by Rick Dark and Doug Tallamy, which Conveniently, I happen to own both of the books, um, and I just highly recommend them. I think they're really great. They contain information about plants you can use and also just designs in general. 
and really how to create an effective, beautiful layered landscape that's going to be aesthetically pleasing to you and also provides a great habitat for your wildlife to come to. So we're going to talk about some of the important keystone species for trees. And these numbers, I think, are amazing. So once again, I'm back on talking about the Lepidoptera. And that's our, our butterflies, moths, and skipper caterpillars um, and adults. <coughs> Excuse me. Native oaks. So if you're going to plant a tree, the most important one you can plant, a native oak. And Doug Tallamy, who I'm a big fan of all of his books, by the way, and if you don't have them, I recommend going out and getting them. The holidays are coming soon. Someone's usually having a birthday. Make great gifts for the nature lover in your life. Um, so if you're interested in oak trees, and they are such an important part of our ecosystem, he explores in this book, I mean, just all the amazing things for oak trees and what they do and all the insects and just, I mean, just all of the life forms that they support. Absolutely amazing. So 534 species of Lepidoptera are supported by oak trees. And that is almost in the entire country. It's like almost 85% of this country, that's that's the case. Because um, there's different exceptions because the United States is a very vast landmass um, with lots of different, we'll touch on this a little bit later, lots of different what they call ecoregions all across the country. Native willows, 456. Native cherries and plums, 456 as well. Native birches, 413. The poplars or cottonwoods, 368. Crab apples, 311. Blueberries and cranberries, technically shrubs, but I have them in here just because they support so many uh, species of Lepidoptera, 288. And our native maples and box elder, 285. All this information was compiled by one of Doug Tallamy's graduate students. So she sat down and she researched this for a year and put all this um, information together. So if you read one of his books, um, you can go into more detail about that. Something else that I think is a great tool and makes this really easy for people to figure out plants they should plant in your specific area is the National Wildlife Federation. So if you look here, the website that's listed at the bottom, that's the nationalwildlifefederation.org um, to the native plant finder. You go there, you put in your zip code, and they give you an entire list of the species that you should focus on in your yard to create a diverse and healthy ecosystem. Fabulous, makes it so easy. And then you can take that list and go shopping for plants. <clears throat> shrubs, so here's a few shrubs that are considered to be keystone species. Black and red chokeberry, dogwood, different species of ilex, so that would be our hollies, our native hollies, inkberries, winterberries, spice bush, which I've talked about a little bit, and Spice bush is, I feel like, a fairly unknown plant, but it's so cool. I think it's so cool. Um, as this picture here is actually taken outside here in the greenhouses and our hoop houses where we have our, our woody plant material. And that little guy is a spice bush swallowtail caterpillar. And he was on our, one of the spice bush out in our hoop houses. And they're very fun. We like to go looking for them uh, the times of year that we know to go look for the caterpillars because that, that leaf was actually rolled up. So they basically make up a little, maybe they make their little house in the leaf and then they hide out in there. And their camouflage, if you can see that, they're actually meant to look like a little snake. So scare the birds away because the birds first first thought when they see a spice bush fall to a caterpillar is that it's a little green snake and they want to stay away from it. But it's going to turn into a very beautiful swallowtail butterfly. But what do they need to eat? Well, spice bush. Um, and then after you've fed the spice bush swallowtail caterpillars with the leaves, then the spice bush will get beautiful berries in the fall that the birds can eat and then sustain themselves on their, during their migrations. One thing to note, though, is that spice bush is one of those plants where you, there are male and female plants. So you have to have the female plants to get the berries and the male plants to pollinate the female plants to get the berries. So if you happen to have spice bush at your house and you've never seen it get berries, it's either a male or a female, but doesn't have a pollinator. Native azaleas are another shrub that I think is really gorgeous. So this is one of our native pink azaleas. 
elderberries are great and viburnums are another great shrub as well. Here's some of our keystone perennials, goldenrods, asters, perennial sunflowers, joe pie weed, our milkweeds, specifically a lot of our asclepias species and phlox. Phlox is also an important one. And here we have a the common buckeye butterfly who's enjoying a New England aster. So I don't know if you've noticed, but when this was promoted, uh, it was this is gonna be a four part lecture series. So I really kind of skimmed over the keystone species, but that's what I'm planning to delve into in the future lectures. I'm gonna have a lecture to focus on the, the canopy trees, the understory trees and shrubs, and then the plants that make up the herbaceous layer when you're planting a, a layered landscape. So I'll be going much more into depth about that in the future. So a reason to come back and visit us again. Let's talk about buying native plants because unfortunately it's not as easy as you think it might be. It can be hard to find a local native plant grower because a lot of nurseries don't source native plants or now they're starting to a little bit more but we're going to talk a little bit about why they're not always equal to what you can find at a local native plant grower so one of the things and i have a slide in a few minutes just to show you um basically every state has a native plant society and it's a great resource because if you go to your native plant society website you can find all kinds of information about the native plants that are great for your region dealing with invasive plant removal in your area. And they all have a page too, to list growers in the area who grow native plants. And sometimes they even have um, mention of some seed sources to use as well. So you wanna use native plants that are native to your, what's called eco region. And that just means that that's your region and all um, basically have a similar habitat and similar needs. So, because I, you know, I'm in Virginia, um, but that doesn't mean that, you know, I should only plant plants like just tiny area. What I'm trying to say is like the state lines don't define the eco region. So you could go up and to above us, you know, into like Maryland or over to Pennsylvania, and you could go down in North Carolina. I mean, if you look and actually, if you Google this, you can see there's all kinds of maps that show you the different eco regions for the United States. Um, so you, you can use that when you determine your planting and you can, also look up to find the plants that are native to the county that you live in and figure out, you know, what's going to grow best in your yard. And there is based, there is a native plant that will do well in every situation that you have, I promise you. And so one thing, well, one of the many things that's great about native plants is, you know, pick a plant that fits the soil that you have. There's always been talk over the years of amending your soil. Stop amending the soil. Instead of amending the soil, pick a plant that's going to grow well in the existing conditions. And like I said, I promise you, there is going to be a native plant that can live in your existing conditions. And something else to think about is trying to use a local ecotype as much as you can. It's more easily said than done at times because this isn't something that nurseries typically focus on yet. Now, this is back to your local native plant grower may have an answer to this. So, your local ecotype is the plant that's best adapted to your region. So pictured here is a blue false indigo, which is one of my favorite native perennials, absolutely gorgeous. So I can have a blue false indigo, a baptisia growing here in Virginia, and I can have one that's growing in Wisconsin. Well, if I'm gonna plant another one here in Virginia, I would rather use a seed source that comes from Virginia versus the one from Wisconsin because the one in Virginia is adapted to slightly different growing habitats um, and conditions than the one in Wisconsin is. And then if you're, you know, live in the Midwest, you're better to go with the one that's been living in the Midwest. Is that always possible? No. And do I think it's better to go ahead and plant native plant, even if the seed comes from the Midwest, instead of, you know, going with a non-native plant? Yes, absolutely. But it's just something to think about. This is a really important one. Are the plants pesticide free? So if you go to a box store and buy your plants, a couple of things. So first of all, if you go to a box store, pretty much any part of this country, they're all pretty much selling the same thing in every store. And are the regions of every part of our country exactly the same? No, we've already touched on that. There's 
a vast amount of difference in the habitat types across the entire country. So really you should be focusing on the plants for your region. And I think this is something else too. Everyone, or not everyone, but we have a lot of people who, um, you know, seem to want to plant the same plants as everyone else, which is great in a way. Um, I think, you know, there's just a lot of thought of like everything looks cohesive then, you know, and, and, and similar. And it just looks so neat and tidy. Sam, so back to neat and tidy. Um, let's embrace messiness. It's okay. You just want to you know, be aware of these things and looking for the plants and back to best adapted for your region. So those are the ones that are going to perform best for you. And I think that a beauty of, especially when you focus on native plants that's often overlooked is I think it's interesting to have your yard change over time. I don't want my yard to be static throughout the entire growing season. I think it's fun and fascinating to watch it evolve over the entire growing season. Why do I want it to look the same? The, for, you know, three or four months out of the year. I think that's boring, you know, and that's just my opinion. Um, but I, I did work in the landscaping industry for a little bit. And that was something that I often ran across was, well, I want you to tell me, you know, what perennial is going to bloom for the entire summer, you know, and it was like, it's back to, they want the yard to look the same one way the entire year. That's not my, that's not my school of thought. And I would like to see us get away from that because back to if we can have a landscape that's constantly changing to meet the needs of the wildlife that depend on it, then we're going to have a thriving habitat and ecosystem to support everyone. Okay, so I'll get off that soapbox for now. Are the plants pesticide free? So one in particular to focus on is the neonicotinoids because there's a lot of plants that are treated with them. Um, in commercial agriculture, and also just in urban situations. It, you as a homeowner don't know this, probably don't haven't thought about it, but at most places you go in your garden center or the box stores, you probably have access to purchasing uh, neonicotinoids and can put them out in your landscape or in your yard. Please don't do it. And don't purchase plants that have been treated with them because it's a <clears throat> this group of chemicals is systemic. So it means they stay in the plants. So you have your pollinators that come to feed on that plant, it is going to kill them. It's poisonous to bees and to other insects as well. And if it doesn't manage to kill them, they've done studies to show that it alters the bee behavior as far as the way that they go to forage their food. Uh, so basically it really messes with their systems. So that's something we need to get away from. And unfortunately, just a lot of these plants are treated with chemicals. And it's it goes back to you, the consumer, you know, at, start asking these questions when you go to buy plants at your garden center. You know, ask them, have their plants been treated? If they have been treated, then tell them, you know, you're not going to buy them. Your money will speak. Also, you know, start asking them about their native plant selections. A lot of garden centers, like I said, are starting to carry native plants, but just a few at a time. But if you ask them to carry more and tell them that that's what you want to spend your money on, then it's going to increase the demand for them. More people will produce them you know, and then we can start to change the tides. So all things to think about. And I also want to talk about native Rs. So this comes up a lot for those of you who know, know what a native R is, or those some of you may not. So a native R is a, a term that's been coined to refer to a cultivar of a native plant. So they have done studies, Doug Tallamy, who I've talked about here with his different books, he uh, is working with a graduate student to do some studies. And a native R is still attractive to a leaf eating insect because there's a lot of people who have said, oh, a native R is not going to be attractive um, versus a straight species plant. Well, if the native R has just been selected for something like, say, to be a shorter plant, it is still getting eaten by insects. The native R's that they found the insects don't want to eat were the ones that have red or purple pigmentation in the leaves. Um, so the insects don't like the pigmentation and they'll stay away from them. So if you're going to go with native R's with the idea of creating a habitat, you know, for your wildlife, then you should stay away from the ones with the red and purple leaves. And sometimes a native R is better, especially if you're someone who doesn't have in a very large yard. A lot of these native R's, the cultivars, um, you know, could be shorter, might not spread as much. So it could be a better fit for your yard and a way to have native plants on a smaller scale. 
Something else has been brought up, which I haven't seen a study about this yet, if, but there's a lot of discussion about it is, and I'll have to go looking and see if the study is being done because I'm sure one will be conducted soon. So for example, like the winterberry holly that's pictured here, this is a straight species winterberry, but there's a lot of them that have been selected, made into, uh, they've selected cultivars and the berries are different colors and the berries are much bigger. So one of the arguments is for the winterberry holly that the native ours aren't good because a bigger berry actually means that it has decreased the number of birds that consume that berry because it's actually become too big for some of the birds to handle with their beaks. So then it's better to go with a straight species. Now you could always do something like, you know, maybe you just absolutely love a cultivar of winterberry holly. So maybe you want to put it in your front yard, use the really showy berry in your front yard, but then plant some of a straight species in, you know, your back backyard that can really support birds and other wildlife when they need food. So I talked a little bit about going to Native Plant Society websites and use them as your resources. Um, and here's just to show you every state has Native Plant Society. And there's great information on their websites. I really encourage you to go visit their websites. And if you're really motivated, go ahead and become a member. They offer lots of different resources for people. Okay, so now we're going to talk about native bees. Native bees are very important pollinators. There are almost 4,000 species of native bees. And we're going to talk about stinging because I feel like a lot of people, the second they hear the word bee, get freaked out and think about stinging. Well, female bumblebees will sting in defense of their homes, but the other native bees are solitary and they are not aggressive. They're really just focused on doing their job, which is gathering pollen and nectar. The stings are usually from honeybees, yellow jackets, or bald-faced hornets. And you're saying, well, you just said honeybees sting. Yes, honeybees sting. Honeybees are not a native bee. Honeybees were brought here from Europe. And basically, honeybees are an agricultural commodity. So people raise them. It, it really, in a way, you can compare it to like, you know, raising livestock or raising chickens. You happen to be raising an insect, um, but you're raising the insect to get the honey from them. Uh, and honeybees, as you know, will sting. So it's really important to provide habitat in your yard for native bees and not just in talking about the plants they're going to use for when they gather their nectar or pollen. Because 70% of these native bees nest in the ground and then 30% of them nest in woody or pithy stems. Bumblebees build nests in shallow holes in the ground where they can find areas where they're protected from rain. And actually bumblebees really like to use like little rock walls too. Um, you know, basically it's going to have a little more protection. So something to consider is trying to have a couple areas near a yard, especially where it's got a southern slope or southern exposure, um, because the, the bees need to have loose soil that can be excavated and is also dry. So the second we plant plants and then put the wood mulch everywhere, it becomes a problem and deters the bees from nesting because they're not strong enough to move the wood mulch aside to get to the ground to create their nest. A better alternative is to use leaf mulch because they can actually move the leaves aside. Um, and then really to go another step beyond that is to what I talked about, to try to leave some bare patches in your yard. You know, it did not have to be huge, but where the bees can go ahead and nest. Stop using the lawn fertilizers near the nesting areas. If you're still going to put on a lawn fertilizer, instead of just stopping it completely, at least stay away from areas where the bees are going to nest because it's it's been shown to be detrimental to the bees. Oh, and this is a picture of the blue orchard mason bee, which is one of our native bees. And really, I just want you to see the mason bee because not all bees are black and yellow. See this little guy? Blue. Isn't he pretty? On a yellow flower. All right, so more about our native bees. So we have the stem nesters and they need pithy stems. And so the plants to plant to sustain these bees are goldenrod, blackberries, our native hydrangeas, joe pieweed, native bunch grasses, rubecchias, 
penstemon and those perennial sunflowers that I touched on before as one of the keystone perennials. So, and those, that's just a few, but that's always a good place to start. Oh, one thing I learned in a webinar that I was watching recently, um, quite fascinating webinar about uh, Brooklyn Bridge Park in New York, but they talked about how the queen bumblebees overwinter under little blue stem. So if you plant little blue stem in this, in your yard, that's great because you're providing homes for uh, places for the queen bumblebee to overwinter. So, but in the spring, just don't, don't go back and cut that grass to the ground. If you feel a need to cut the grass back, just cut off the flowers on the top, but leave the leaves hanging to the ground to protect the bumblebees. And then stem nesters need woody stems. And something that's great for that would be the elderberry shrub that I had talked about before. And just having some dead branches around and leaving them and also downed trees. It's back to, you know, we have this idea and as a society, we think that our yard has to be pristine and cleaned up it's okay to be a little bit messy. Like I basically, I'm, you know, giving you permission to be, you know, not a lazy gardener because there's some things I'm asking, you know, talking about here that involve work, but in some aspects, yes, be a lazy gardener. So don't remove every dead branch, um, you know, and don't trim out every dead branch out of every shrub. So like the elderberry shrub in general, you know, will tend to get, you know, a dead branch here and there, leave it, leave it. A native bee needs it. Um, for its habitat, you know, or if it really, really bothers you, then just find a place to put some dead branches. Um, but, but they need dead wood to reproduce. Oh, and if you really want to learn a lot about native bees, this photo of the stem that's um, excavated by a bee, so you can see all that white stuff coming out. So that's what the bee excavated from inside the stem. This lady, Heather Holm, uh, she's quite fascinating and she's done, she does a lot of research with native bees. It's, it's just amazing what she has learned. And actually, she's the one. So I, I found this um, graphic on a website, um, her website, her website connected with her. And I just thought it was absolutely fantastic. But it's all about how to create habitat for stem nesting bees and talks to you about, you know, leaving the dead flower stalks in the winter and spring. You cut the stalks back, but you leave some there, ideally 24 inches. Um you know, the summer, then the new growth is going to come up from the plant. It will hide the dead stems that you left, you know, and all it talks about all about then and goes through, um, you know, the bees laying their eggs, the larvae developing, how they're hibernating in there, and then going through um, and emerging as well to, you know, continue the bee population. So we're just talking about providing habitat for the bees, but you also have to have continuous food sources for them and really from March to October. So when you're thinking about planting, you know, you want to have plants that are flowering throughout that entire range of time. And many bees actually require pollen from specific plants to reproduce. So here's just a few of those again, it would be the, are you noticing a theme here? Uh, goldenrod, <laughs> asters, evening primrose, native willows, and blueberry are necessary for the reproduction of 69 species of native bees. And these are bees that are considered to be real specialist bees. And then we have native bees that are more generalist. But if you include these species of plants to support the specialist bees, the generalist bees will follow. But are you noticing like a lot of the keystone plants I've mentioned and other plants I've mentioned um, just as the talk goes along? They're starting to be a, th a theme because they continue to repeat and how they're important to sustain wildlife. And I also touched on this a little bit, but I'm going to talk more in depth about that. So at this time of the year, once again, you know, people think that all their perennials have to be cut back. Not so. To have a healthy ecosystem and habitat, don't cut your perennials back. I'm giving you permission to do less work this fall. Embrace it. So instead of cutting your perennials back in the fall, wait until spring. And as I was showing in the diagram, there's many native bees that overwinter in these stems. And then when spring comes around, you can go ahead and cut them back to two feet, like if you have a really tall perennial, um, but then leave that dead stem for the bees to you know, provide them with habitat and lay their eggs. And if you have a meadow, because a lot of meadows, they talk about mowing your meadow every spring, but just adopt a different pattern. So instead of cutting the entire meadow, 
cut one third of the meadow and leave two thirds and then continue on that, you know, rotate it. So every year you cut a third and leave the other two thirds and you just wrote on a rotational basis. And then just some things to show you. So the picture with the sign about the nesting insects is from Lurie Garden in Chicago, which is a very, I hope most, it's a very famous garden in Millennium Park in downtown Chicago. Um, and they're using signage to educate the public about why they're leaving some of the stems in the garden to provide habitat for the bees. And then this photo is actually from not my yard. And I think it's, this is something I enjoy when it actually snows in Virginia. I'm from Wisconsin originally, so I actually really like the snow. Um, and I'm happy when it snows here. And I think it's quite beautiful. And so one of the things I love is to see is, here's my purple cone flowers, which I did not cut back, um, covered in snow. Great food source. Goldfinches especially really love to come and eat purple cone flower seeds. And yes, if any of you who are watching are true native plant enthusiasts, yes. <coughs> oh, excuse me. Technically, the purple cone flower, <coughs> you can have an argument about it because it's not um, actually native to the state of Virginia. But it's a great plant anyway. So it's one of those native plants where I'm going to, native to the United States, um, but I'm going to make an exception to include it in my yard because I do really enjoy it. <coughs> All right, so some other reasons to not cut your frontals back in the fall. I just touched on the seeds of the coneflower feeding birds, goldfinches. Goldfinches really love to have seeds to feed on um, from your plants during over the winter. They love to feed on the coneflowers. They love to feed on the different Rebecca seeds. Goldenrod is a big one. So it's, you know, it's, it's nature's feeder for the birds during the winter so they can sustain themselves and survive. And then something that I think is really interesting is the relationship between birds and goldenrod. So another thing during the winter, because we've talked about at the beginning about how nutritious caterpillars are, well, there's a, a gall fly and it lays a larva in a goldenrod stem and it causes more formation to grow in the stem called the gall. I'm, you've all seen galls. You may not know that that's what you have seen, but you know, they're all over in nature if you really start looking around in different plants and trees. Um, but in the winter, they've studied this. Downy woodpeckers in particular really love goldenrod because they will go to the goldenrod gall in the winter and they will use that sharp little woodpecker beak to peck in there and then get the larva from this gall fly. And that's great food for them in the winter when food can be really scarce. I love woodpeckers. I think they're just amazing. Really one of my favorite birds. Well, there's a few birds I, I could say that I don't like. I like most birds, but I, I do really love watching woodpeckers. I think they're fascinating. Okay, mosquitoes. Yes, let's talk about mosquitoes. <clears throat> yes, I know most people don't like mosquitoes. I can't say I like getting beat, bit by mosquitoes. And yes, they do vector a lot of diseases. But I'm going to play devil's advocate and let's, act, let's talk about there are some good things that mosquitoes do. So females bite only to lay eggs. And that's because they need the protein uh, for their eggs to develop. So once they've bitten, then they will go off and lay their eggs. And yes, I know that's the annoying part. And like I said, I, I mean, I don't like getting mosquito bites at all. Not fun. Um, but the male mosquitoes are actually pollinators and the females too, once they've gotten past laying their eggs. Uh, and so therefore they, they pollinate plants and they eat the nectar. Mosquito larva is actually a great food for fish and also dragonfly larva and other species that are in the water as well because mosquito larva develop in the water. And adult mosquitoes are a food source for other insects. So bats, birds, reptiles, and amphibians do all eat mosquitoes. Okay, so let's talk about mosquito spraying because it seems to be everywhere these days. So the companies that spray for mosquitoes are spraying Almost always a pyrethroid based insecticide, and it doesn't just kill mosquitoes because there is no such thing as just being able to kill the adult mosquitoes. You are killing all insects in your yard. And that is the exact opposite thing you want to do if you're trying to create a diverse habitat. Now, I know that they say the applicators, you know, stick to like the green plants, um, you know, like on the edges. But like, look at this here. This is a silvery checker spot butterfly, and it's just resting on green leaves. Are there any flowers in the picture? No, you know, so if this butterfly is just resting there and they come to spray, then it's, you know, unintentionally, um, you know, going to be killed as well, along with the adult mosquitoes. 
you know, and I, I personally, I just, I don't, I just don't like all these chemicals in my environment. Um, but fogging is expensive and it's actually the most ineffective way to control mosquitoes because the most ineffective way to control mosquitoes is by going after the adult form of mosquitoes. So we're going to talk about that in another, in a second here. Um, and also another reason to get rid of English ivy, besides the fact that it's an invasive plant, it is a mosquito breeding ground. Mosquitoes love to breed in English ivy because you have that like thicker leaf. Um, it's a little bit cupped. So it really can hold a lot of moisture in the leaf or right under it. And mosquitoes love to breed in it. So if I didn't give you enough reason before to remove English ivy just because it's an invasive plant, remove the English ivy to help control your mosquito population. Okay, so now if you still want to get rid of mosquitoes, and I didn't wasn't able to convince you that they actually have value in our ecosystem, which mosquitoes do actually have value as part of our ecosystem. Um, <clears throat> here's how to control their numbers. So go around your yard and remove their breeding ground because that's going to be any kind of item that holds standing water. So you want you're controlling the situation here. So get rid of all those items that hold standing water, and then you're basically creating a lure for the female mosquitoes. So, and this is what Doug Tallamy, who I've been toting his books here, recommends. And if I didn't mention this before, he's a professor of entomology at the University of Delaware. So who knows better how to control insects than an entomologist? This is what he says to do. So get a bucket or a tub and fill it with some water and then put in a little star hay and let it ferment because female mosquitoes love this kind of stagnant water to lay their eggs in. And this will attract the female mosquitoes. They will come and they will lay the eggs in your bucket. <clears throat> and then you just go online. Basically, this is, here's one example of the, the, the Pond Guy website. You can buy these dunks or they have these like little granules um, of BT, which is a naturally occurring bacteria. And you put that in the bucket and then it will control the mosquito larvae. And you um, basically have to put one in there once a month. And that's how to effectively control mosquitoes. Um, Helen Yost, who's on this gardenrant.com blog that I like to read their stuff. She has said she's tested out in her own yard. She lives in North Carolina and she said that she's noticed a difference. Um, so it's a lot cheaper than having someone come and fog your yard and it's safe for humans, pets, and wildlife. So a win-win. Like I said, if you, if I didn't convince you that, you know, mosquitoes can still survive. And the bottom line is, though, we don't want to eliminate mosquitoes completely. Back to all the parts of the ecosystem are important, whether or not we want to admit it. All right. So something else that I think is really fascinating is parasitoid wasps. So, you know, there's a lot of caterpillars out in the environment, and a lot of people get freaked out, especially when they see them on their vegetable plants. Um, but there are these parasitoid wasps out there and they will actually come and lay their eggs in the caterpillar. And what you see on both these caterpillars is actually the wasp cocoons. And so once you see that happen, this caterpillar is not going to feed on your plant anymore. You just leave it. And then the little wasp will actually hatch out of there. If you can see on the bottom, right, there's actually a tiny wasp who's just hatched and it's fantastic because it's natural control and nature just helped you, helped you out. And the other reason for letting it, let leaving the caterpillars is, you know, the more that the <clears throat> more caterpillars there are, the more wasps that will come and lay their eggs, and then you have more natural predators in your yard to help you deal with your other pests. Lights. Okay, so let's talk about lights real quick. So there's done studies to show that lights are causing insect populations to be reduced because nocturnal insects are drawn to lights and they get killed when they collide with the bulbs. They don't collide with the bulbs. They burn up their energy reserves because they basically, you know, fly crazy patterns all around the lights all night. Um, and then by morning, you know, they're an easy target for their predators, the bats, the birds, um, other insect predators like spiders. Because a lot of these, especially moths, I mean, when they reach adult form, their primary purpose is simply to go reproduce. So when this happens and they're drawn to the lights instead, then they've eliminated the important stage of the adult moth, which is to actually going to reproduce and they've simply um, been killed instead. So then that you know affects the overall population numbers. Another insect that I hope is near and dear to most people's hearts is the firefly. And 
they're doing studies are showing that light pollution is negatively affecting the firefly populations as well. So when artificial light is present, it's all their their flashes per minute, so how they communicate with each other are decreased by almost 50%. And they're having issues with their courtship, so their mating um, is reduced as well because almost 70% reduction in their flashing to communicate with each other um, when there's a lot of light pollution. So this is really simple. Either go ahead and turn off your lights. You know, if you're really concerned, you don't think that's safe, then switch to motion, motion sensor lights. Or if you just really feel like you have to have a light on all night, then go out and get an amber colored bulb because the insects will still be drawn to it, but not as much um, as the traditional lights. Okay, leaves. I'll sum this up by saying, just leave the leaves. Um, so leaves are great because they're nature's mulch. They re return nutrients to the soil. So that's free fertilizer. They create ideal conditions for the plant. It's basically a, a plant, you know, it has what it needs. Um, you know, nature's a wonderful thing. So an oak tree, what's the perfect mulch for an oak tree? Its own leaves. What's the perfect mulch for lots of evergreen trees? Well, their own needles. Um, you know, a lot of times the if you'd actually leave them in a nature, for example, like some certain evergreens when the needles fall to the ground, they'll break down and actually acidify the soil and create the perfect growing conditions for that plant. It's really quite amazing. Leaves are also free weed control, free soil amendments, and they're important because they feed the organisms in the soil and the insect decomposers that we need to help help recycle, you know, dead plant material. And here's just some fun photos. There's a turtle hiding in the leaf litter or, or trying to hide from me um, by sucking inside. And then I love toads. And um, this little toad was making a home in a pot on my front porch because I simply had, I was running behind in my planting. So not leaves, but I just like to show that, you know, toads will utilize um, just a little bit of loose, moist soil to make a happy little home. So this fall, when you're thinking about leaf removal, just remove the leaves from your lawn and leave them everywhere else. Plants will grow up through the leaf litter. This picture is actually from my front yard. Um, and two great native plants, Virginia bluebells and spring beauty, actually just, just growing right up through the leaves. Here's some other benefits of leaves that we usually don't think about. So a layer of leaf litter actually acts like a sponge when it rains and will soak up the rainwater. And it, a lot of times too, if you've got leaves, it'll help slow the rainwater down and prevent areas um, you know, of erosion with really fast runoff. And then the leaves will actually slowly release the moisture back into the plants and keep them hydrated even during dry spells. So that's great. It means all these things that nature will do for you if you just let it. Leaves also provide habitat for arthropod predators, and they're incredibly important to leave the leaves because of caterpillar pupation. So I was talking about that earlier with, for example, like the monarch butterflies leaving their host plants. So over 90% of caterpillars pupate off the host plant, and there's a lot of caterpillars that are up in the trees and then will actually drop to the ground and pupate on the forest floor or just in the leaf litter, or they'll make an underground chamber. Well, if they're gonna make an underground chamber, the soil has to be loose and pretty rich so they can actually dig down in there. So when we just have lawn right up to our trees, that's usually a really hard compacted uh, soil right there. So it makes them really hard for the caterpillar to dig into the ground. If you simply replace the grass on your trees with the native ground covers and then leave your leaves, then you're gonna be creating a great habitat so the caterpillars can actually go ahead and pupate. So all reasons to just leave the leaves, don't remove them. And this is the Luna moth, one of our gorgeous native moths. And you can see here, this is the different stages. So the Luna moth cocoon, which is just made out of leaves um, and the silk that the caterpillar is spun. And then they cut away that outer cocoon. So you can see the pupa and then the absolutely a gorgeous adult Luna moth. Oh, brush piles. Yes, just another thing. See, I'm just continuing, continuing to encourage you to be messy. So brush piles, great overwintering habitats for stem boring bees. They also provide shelter for birds and other animals during snowstorms and when they're trying to escape from predators. And then just let the pile break down and it'll put nutrients back into the soil. 
and also provides habitat for salamanders, toads, and other insects. So here's a little bit about how to create a successful brush pile. So you wanna create a foundation using large logs and then you're gonna pile branches on top of that. And basically you wanna build the pile up in layers, um, but make sure to leave open pockets so the birds can actually fly in there to take shelter. Dead trees. Okay. So this is back to the idea of something dies and we immediately have to remove it. Well, when we do that, we're actually removing an important part of the ecosystem. So if it's safe, leave the dead tree standing. That's ideal. Number one choice. Number two choice, if it's not safe to do that, at least cut out, just cut off the top of the tree, but leave a good 15 to 20 feet to create. And it's called a dead tree, a standing dead tree. It's called a snag, by the way, just the terminology. So you know how you have a snag. Um, it will still be a benefit. Cavities provide food, shelter, and nesting sites for over 85 species of birds in Canada and the United States. There's 25 species alone in Virginia that have to have cavities to complete their life cycle. So, and they also are homes for wood boring beetles and carpenter ants that feed the birds and places for birds to roost and perch, especially raptors. Uh, and I was back to, so I said, I just, I love woodpeckers and I really do. Um, and you can see if you look to the far right, that is um, a parent pileated woodpecker with its babies in a tree cavity. And then the top is actually a juvenile uh, pileated woodpecker at my house, which I was so excited um, like every time we see him. And it's really, really rare to see them like this because pileated woodpeckers are actually really shy birds and tend to stay in the woods because that's where they get their food. But I could tell it was a juvenile by the way he was just acting and flying. Um, and he came to our suet feeder to get some feed. So we enjoyed watching him last year. Other reasons why dead trees are important because up to 30% of forest insect species need dead or dying wood to complete their life cycles. So no dead or dying wood, no insects. Uh, two of them are stag beetles. There's 24 species of stag beetles in North America and they only use large or completely dead trees. And then best beetles, which are four species in North America and they live in fallen trees. And the only time that they leave the tree is to go off and find a mate. I won't go into details, but as I was reading about these, but they're really quite fascinating. If you start to read about insects and their life cycles and their different behaviors, I, I mean, to me anyway, I just think it's incredibly amazing. Other ways you can help. So install window wall covers. So a lot of people have window wells, their houses, and unfortunately just a lot of little creatures, you know, toads, salamanders, skinks, you know, voles, um, end up getting trapped in window wells and simply starve to death. So if we just went to the store and got a few of those, you know, really inexpensive cheap covers and covered up your window wells, we would help, we would eliminate that problem. Set your mower height higher than you think uh, higher. Um, three, at least three inches, four inches is even better and make sure you mow during the day. Re one of the reasons for that is because um, there's a lot of, you know, wildlife that's active in the early morning or as dusk comes around. And if you set your mower height higher, then you'll most likely be able to mow over them. Um, and when I say them, I'm talking about box turtles. We've lost, we lose a lot of turtles to, uh, death by lawnmower, which is just no way that I want anyone to go. Um, a small bubbling water feature in your yard is a great place and it really attracts birds. And I say bubbling because stagnant water is going to attract, what do we talk about? Mosquitoes. Um, bubbling water really attracts birds, won't attract the mosquitoes. And it's fun because you also get that great bubbling water sound. Um, and it, the advantage is you don't have to be out there like cleaning your bird bath every day if you have a bubbler in it with the moving water helps keep it clean. And some other ways to help. Uh, if you're going to go with a bee hotel, go with several small bee hotels around your yard, not those giant bee hotels you're starting to see. And really the best thing is to just you know, do what we've already talked about, which is go to changing the way you cut back your perennials. It's really just a way they want you to spend their money. So if you if you already if you go ahead and create the habitat um, in your yard using the plant material, you don't have to invest in bee hotels. And 
because there's some issues with that. So when you put up a really big bee hotel, um, they've, they've found that, guess what? The predators learn this um, and then they just go, go there and sit and lie and wait for the bees to emerge and then just pick them off. Easy prey. Um, and also it really easily spreads disease as well. So a small bee hotel, if you absolutely must have them. Oh, and the butterfly houses, totally just a marketing gimmick. They really just want you to spend their money. Butterflies don't need them. Back to plant the native plants to sustain the populations. Please rethink rodent bait stations. They have documented over 25 different species of wildlife that have been poisoned by them, not just rodents. Um, and that's only the, the species that they've actually been able to document because it's really hard to document uh, wildlife poisonings. And that's primary poisoning. We also lose a lot of species to secondary exposure. So to the predators that eat poison rodents, and then it simply moves up the food chain because if a rodent goes into the bait station and consumes the bait, it doesn't die right away. It usually becomes very lethargic and then it's easy uh, target for a predator. The predator consumes the rodent and then the predator dies as well. And then, you know, someone else can come along and feed them the predator and then that animal gets affected and it just keeps passing up the food chain. So food for thought. And also just, just please keep your cats indoors because they have documented that they're killing 2.4 billion birds a year just with cats. So just keep your cat inside. And oh, well, I, I just had to show. So this is my oldest daughter, Madeline, Maddie. And I think this is just another great way, a thing to do is get kids excited or involved with nature. Um, she gets so excited and it's just, it's really just wonderful for me to see. It makes me really happy. Um, so just on the left, this is, she, she wasn't even a year old and I already would have her in her high chair watching birds. Can't see it cause it's so tiny, but we put peanuts out on the deck railing and the blue jays will come and eat them. Um, and sometimes the tough to tit mice too. Um, this is really fun to watch and she, she would sit there and watch them. And then now that she's older, uh, she's really into watching the butterfly caterpillars. So this is, um, a plant or parsley I have on our deck and, the black swallowtails come and lay their eggs on it. And so we've reared um, multiple generations of butterflies, swallowtails this summer. And she just loves it so much that she dictated a story to my mother-in-law about caterpillars, which I just really touched my heart when I saw it and seeing the look on her face too, because it just, you know, she looks so proud of herself and that's just so wonderful. So great way to get your kids involved in something and, you know, talk to them or just, just, you know, have some fun and then they'll learn to become good stewards of, the earth because they've grown up with it. So if you have only a few things you take away from today, you know, go, go look at your yard, please. And think about, you know, what you can do to reduce the size of your lawn, start learning about invasive plants and removing them. Think about how, you know, you could add some plants to your yard to create habitat and create a viable ecosystem as well. And, as I mentioned before, I'm going to do three other lectures to talk uh, in detail about the canopy trees, the understory trees and shrubs, and the herbaceous uh, ground layer. So I hope in the future you'll join me for that. And I hope you can also tell this is a topic that I'm really passionate about and hope other, join, other people will join me as well in adding native plants to your landscape. And I'm just going to share with you, here's some of the references I've used. So I talked to you um, before I had mentioned the first book about, you know, designing your landscape, I'm really into Doug Tallamy's books, the entomologist from the University of Delaware. He, you know, really backs up everything he says with research and talks to you about what you can do in your own yard. And this Homegrown National Park is a website that he's behind has started to this movement to basically uh, create you know, use everyone's yards. And if we all band together, we create our own uh, national park together. Um, so I really encourage you to go check that out. Um, and just some other resources as well. Mount Cuba Centers in Delaware, and they do amazing research native plants. And it's a lovely garden. So you can go visit it and you can get some planting ideas. And in fact, they have a formal garden that they design using only native plants. So if formal is your look, if you don't like the really, you know, the wild uh, um, messy look. Like I said, you can still have a formal garden of native plants. 
Um, and just some other websites that I think are really valuable to visit as well. And then just to show you some more of these beautiful native plants that I really love. And then I'll also gladly take questions as well. So good replacements for a lawn that help control runoff. Um, so some things to think about would be plant species that spread using rhizomes because that will spread quickly and also form a really good network on the ground um, to help you control runoff. Also, like I mentioned, you know, leave the leaves to help slow things down. Um, and you could look at if you want something that kind of looks like a lawn. Think about carex or start researching the carex species because as i mentioned really briefly carex are an amazing group of plants that most people never think about um, but they're adapted to lots of different kinds of situations and if you really like the look of a lawn they'll still you still kind of give you a look um you know and then help you control the runoff as well because you just really need stuff to kind of slow down the rain and catch it and there's also a lot of information out of there about if you start Googling like how to create a rain garden. So if you actually want to go ahead and like create a depression to catch your rainwater, that's something to consider as well. So um, I know I aren't really long, so I don't have a lot of time to answer questions, but I will be doing the future lectures and talking about the specific plants. So we can really delve into, um, you know, specific plants and you know, how to utilize them when designing your landscape and address certain problems um, in the future lectures. I just, there's so much to talk about and I get so excited about all of it. But so thank you everyone for joining me and I hope you found this useful. And like I said, I hope you'll keep in mind the future lectures that I'm do doing and join me for those as well. And we can all go on this native plant um, journey and creating habitats and great ecosystems together.